Welcome to episode 27 of the Yoga Meets Movement Science podcast. Our focus for today is to take a good look at the shoulders, at the shoulders. So the shoulders, that's an area of the body that um, is really involved and integral in so much of what we do, especially if we're yoga practitioners uh, in, involved in what we do on the yoga mat. But of course, the shoulders are involved in so many other movement pursuits. And 100%, they're a huge part of just how we move throughout our daily life. So the shoulders, even though they might seem like kind of a small area of the body, there's actually a ton going on there. And there's a ton to dive into if we really want to give a good look at them. The um, areas of the shoulders serves to transmit force between our arm and our trunk or the arm and the torso. So they play a really important role that way. And uh, they also have um, mobility inherent to them. And so mobility in the shoulder helps us move our arms through space and let our hands reach out there and interact with the environment. So they're just super important. In our yoga practice specifically, we tend to use our shoulders quite a bit. Uh, if you think of just all the like, when we have our hands down on the yoga mat and we're bearing weight in our arms and just so much that we do on the mat, kind of in uh, movement patterns like that, that's very shoulder focused. So we utilize our shoulder strength in our yoga practice, you know, things like arm balances, inversions. We also utilize shoulder flexibility slash mobility in our yoga practice. If you think of things like arm binds and a lot of the things we do with our arms overhead, like downward facing dog, handstand, things like that. Uh, and from just kind of like a, a movement control perspective, the shoulders and kind of where they're positioned are intimately connected to what we're doing with our hands and how they're interacting with the environment. Are we reaching? Are we pressing the floor away? All kinds of stuff like that. So, uh, so yeah, the shoulders actually play this huge role. And when it comes to a yoga practice uh, or any form of movement practice, we can certainly enhance that um, how we move through those practices by targeting our shoulders and thinking about our shoulders, maybe making them stronger, maybe making them more mobile and all sorts of good things. So for our conversation in today's episode, our plan is to talk briefly, uh, kind of kind of on like a, a just an introductory level to talk about shoulder anatomy, because we want to have a little bit of that as a foundation to then talk about some of these other topics. Uh, we want to talk about how the shoulders move. We want to talk about how to strengthen the shoulders, like how we would want to load the shoulders in order to build strength. We would like to focus on whether a yoga practice really strengthens the shoulders. And if so, how, and you know, like how, how strengthening for the shoulders is a yoga practice truly. Uh, we also may touch on things like quote, healthy shoulder movement, and then um, movement that, that potentially might be pathological or sometimes known as scapular dyskinesis is kind of like a technical term. So we might touch on that. There are lots of myths about the shoulders that kind of permeate the yoga, the movement worlds, also just kind of general um, societal ideas about the shoulders. So we'll we'll touch on some of those as well. Uh, we'll talk about how to how to protect the shoulders from injury and pain, specifically like kind of with a focus on within a yoga practice. Like how might we want to think about that? Um, we might talk about why people's shoulders tend to make a lot of noise, like a lot of crackles and pops, right? Like that's kind of a common experience. So we might talk about that. So those are some of our ideas for today, for today's discussion. And we want to make sure to tell you that we are releasing this episode on this topic of the shoulders in conjunction with the release of a brand new program that Travis and I are super excited about. We, uh, it, ha it releases this week. It's actually, by the time you're listening to this, it will have already, yeah, it'll have already released. And uh, it is called Five Weeks to Strong and Flexible Shoulders. And it's under the umbrella of Travis's My Business Strength for Yoga. So by the title of the program, you can probably surmise that it's a five-week program that will strengthen and build flexibility in your shoulders. And uh, we really love this program. It's a unique offering for us. It's the first time that we've offered 
actually like follow along led strength practices. So it kind of sets these programs apart from our other strength yoga pro products, which we also love, but we just want to offer well-rounded offerings. So yeah, these are follow along practices. They're short 20 to 25 minute practices. You'll receive a, a new one every three days for five weeks and you get to decide when to start. You'll, you'll initiate the program whenever you're ready and then it will start from that day onward. So yeah, five weeks of strong and flexible shoulders. It's on special launch release sale right now as we speak until uh, October 17th. So if you're listening to this through October 16th, that is, uh, you can order it on special launch release sale. If you're listening to this from the 17th onward, you can absolutely still snag our program, but it'll just be at full price. And if you, uh, to get our program, just go to the strengthforyoga.com slash five dash weeks. And that link is of course also in our show notes. So anyway, we want to tell, make sure to tell you about that. We're super excited. And finally, before we dive into today's conversation, just to let you know that if you're a regular podcast listener, you're probably used to our podcast coming out every two weeks. That's kind of our regular schedule. But because of these exciting new programs, we also have one on the hamstrings. If you listened to last week's episode, you'll know about that. But because of these two programs, we wanted to release these two episodes one week apart. And that means that therefore there will be like a th three weeks between this episode and our next one. So just know that if you happen to notice or, or are in tune with our schedule. So with all of that said, it's time to take our focus and actually talk about the shoulders. So Travis, thanks so much for being here with me today to talk about this topic. Thanks for that terrific introduction. You're welcome. There are kind of a lot of points I feel like I had to, had to mention. I there. think you got it all. <laughs> Thank you very much. Got to be thorough. Um, so the shoulders, you know, it's, uh, it, it's an area of the body that might seem, seem kind of small. It's like just where the arm plugs into the torso. It and, is small, actually. Like yeah, the, well, right. I said if you small, look at the ball and socket, no, but if you look in the ball and socket <laughs> joint, like, holy cow, that's kind of a small area for all these big, important things to be taking place at. That's a really good point. Yeah, it is. It is literally small. So maybe when I say that it seems like it's small, what I really mean more is like, it seems like it's simple or insignificant right. or just not like a big deal, not a big deal to focus on. That's kind of what I mean. But you're right. The actual shoulder joint is super small. So is it true that like, it's just this, you know, kind of simple area of the body? No, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's actually anatomically much more complicated than maybe we think. Like if we think, mm -hmm. okay, there's just the shoulder joint, like that's kind of how we talk about it. Right. And we know that it's this ball and socket joint, but actually if you consult an anatomy textbook, you would see that the shoulder joint is actually referred to as the shoulder complex mm -hmm. and it's made up of multiple joints and multiple bones, mm -hmm. not just the ball and socket joint itself, which if you help just looking at the bigger picture of the shoulder and all of the joints and bones that comprise it help you better understand why it works the way it works and and what go can go right and what can go not so right that is so true so kind of when we understand the underlying anatomy of the area it can help us understand these broader implications right so so we we know that most people know that the shoulder joint is a ball and socket joint but that's just the glenohumeral joint, so the uh, humerus and the glenoid fossa of the scapula or shoulder blade. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what people think of as the shoulder maybe, mm -hmm. which is true. Um, but then there's also the scapula so that maybe, how do we start? So the, <laughs> the scapula is a bone. It's what's, what's the, there's a technical term for the shape of the bone, but it's kind of like a flat bone. Oh yeah. I think flat bone. It's kind of triangular. Okay. I know that's not the technical term, but it's kind of yeah. like an upside down triangle. Roughly. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of sits on your thoracic uh, or on your rib cage mm -hmm, like uh, the upper... at the thoracic level of your spine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, the, the humerus, kind of attaches to so the the scapula has this socket called the glenoid fossa mm -hmm. and the humerus or the head of the humerus kind of sits in that glenoid fossa but the and maybe we've mentioned this before that glenoid fossa the 
uh, analogy of the relative size of these things, the, the head of the humerus is like a golf ball on a tee mm -hmm. as far as the congruency of the joint. So if, if we w go back to the, let's compare to the hip, the, uh, ball and socket of the hip, like the, the acetabulum of the hip or the pelvis really encapsulates the, um, the thigh bone, mm -hmm. the, the head of the what's femur. the, that one. Yeah. So that one, like it's really, really, there's full coverage of the head of the femur In the inside the acetabulum. Yeah. So like when you get a hip socket, not to get overly graphic or when you get a hip replacement, um, you really like have to yank that <laughs> hip out of there versus people's shoulders dislocate all the time. I mean, right. maybe not all the time. Some people, yeah. And if you have one, maybe you're more likely to have another. Uh, mm -hmm. But but it's it's relatively more easy for that head of the humerus to just kind of pop out of the mm -hmm. um, the glenoid fossa because um, the like I said, it's just this golf ball on a tee. So that as far as like the bony congruence or where the bones mm -hmm. connect, uh, and then it takes all of these soft tissues uh, surrounding it, ligaments rotator cuff, blah, 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 mm -hmm. uh, that keep the shoulder in its place. But so that's the glenohumeral joint. But then what are some of the other joints that make up this shoulder complex? Right. So the glenohumeral joint is like uh, the humerus, which uh, that's the upper arm bone, just in case we didn't say that before. That's where the humerus mm -hmm. plugs into or whatever connects to the shoulder blade. And then we have the um, the joint of the shoulder blade or the scapula actually sitting on the upper back or on the thorax. Like, so there's, mm -hmm. it's technically a joint between the shoulder blade and the back. And sort it's of. not, yeah, exactly. It's not like a, a typical joint that we tend to, it's not like a structural joint. It's considered a functional joint. So it behaves as a joint, but its structure isn't similar. And, to that, that. and that's because like normally joints are two bones kind mm -hmm. of, connected by other stuff, <laughs> um, ligaments, but mm -hmm. the, in this case, there's not exactly a ligamentous connection between the scapula and the thoracic, or, or maybe it's like varied across people, but it's just kind of like the way that it sits with mm -hmm. some of the other structures surrounding it, it creates like a pseudo joint. Yeah, so I think so. Yeah, I kind of think Jive with it. your yeah, understanding. It does. Yeah, it's like kind of floating for lack of a better term on the upper back rather than being like really like you said tethered to or connected bone to bone mm -hmm. um and yeah it's more like these soft like muscles and uh like you said ligaments that tend to kind of hold it hold it in place and move it around or the muscles at least mm -hmm. yeah so that's another joint and, and that where and the scapula on the upper back technically has like a name that joint is called the scapulothoracic joint which probably makes sense because we've already talked about like the regions of the body that are involved so scapula thoracic is the shoulder blade on the upper back. And I just would like to volunteer that I certainly remember <clears throat> that uh, before I learned about the shoulder, if you would just ask me like, hey, what's the shoulder? I would have said it's like, well, it's where your arm plugs into like your torso, basically. You know, it just seems like that's what's oh. plugs directly in. But then sure. when you actually look at it, you realize actually the upper arm bone, the humerus doesn't plug it directly into the torso, it plugs into the shoulder blade and then the shoulder blade sits on the torso, right? Travis, yeah. would you agree with that? I would totally agree with that. So on the outside, it just seems pretty simple. And then mm -hmm. you find out that there's this whole shoulder blade thing going on in between the arm and the torso. Yeah, exactly. So before the, so the upper arm bone doesn't even connect to the, directly to the torso. It's like via the scapula, which is kind of the smallish like I said, kind of floating bone. I don't know if that's really the best word, but in my mind, it just kind of floats floats there, which maybe is also part of why when you compared the shoulder joint to the hip joint and the hip joint just has a lot more inherent structural stability, we can sort of see how the shoulder's a little different that way, right? Oh yeah, because the the femur really does connect right to the pelvis, Yeah, the which pelvis, then connects right. to the, well, I guess the pelvis then connects to the spine torso Mm -hmm. so, the, so there is the, some like the, similarity yeah but the pelvis is so much more um robust yeah it just like it doesn't have as much uh, like play as the shoulder blade does right so well, and probably for good reason because the your arm is doing more fine motor yeah tasks that kind of require 
more control. Maybe more mobility. The, yeah. 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 And the, the hip is just like the lower body is more of a brute force. Yeah. It bears more load. Think of walking and running. And mm -hmm. yeah, it makes sense evolutionarily when you look at how the body, how and why the body evolved to be these forms mm -hmm. we're in today. So Travis, you mentioned that the shoulder, the shoulder region uh, is actually made up of three bones. And you asked me about what were the other joints. So mm -hmm. maybe I'll just throw those out there. I feel like the two we've already introduced, the glenohumeral joint and the scapula thoracic, those are the main two we will focus on today as far as like the big movements that happen in the shoulders. Sure. But I guess to be thorough, we should point out there are two other joints, right? Between it's That true. are involved in this other bone. <laughs> it's true. <clears throat> One, and it's, it's all connected. It's all, and it's all important. But like when I think about or when I teach less, movement, less from like a volitional. Yes. Well, yeah. Or Go gross, so what, gross what, movement. Yeah. Yeah. So what's the last? Uh, so bone the last and... bone is your clavicle. Your clavicle. AKA your collarbone. Your collarbone. Exactly. Thanks for reminding me of the yeah more everyday term. Yeah, mm -hmm. and people generally know what the collarbones are, where they are. But that yeah. bone is the third bone uh, that makes up the three bones of the shoulder joint complex. That bone, the clavicle, it uh, has a joint between the clavicle and the sternum, which is like that flat mm -hmm. bone right in the middle of your chest. And uh, that joint is called the sternoclavicular joint. So that's probably all we're going to say about that today. And then the clavicle at the other end, out laterally, it connects to this um, protrudence, I guess you could say, of the shoulder blade that's called the acromion. Mm -hmm. And um, that connection between those two is the, is the acromioclavicular joint. Right? So those are the other two. They move, but just not, as, not on this gross level that we see with our eyes as much as the other two. Yeah. I don't think you, th you, you think about it as much. <laughs> like when you shrug your shoulders or mm -hmm. uh, retract or protract your shoulder blade, the clavicle is also moving. It's yes, you're so elevating, right. depressing, rotating, but it just, it kind of goes along for the ride. It's not, it's not something that you really think about until it becomes a problem. It's true. Uh, you know, if, if you injure that area, then it's like suddenly, oh, uh, that thing needs to move so that my shoulder, because when you elevate the scapula, the acromioclavicular joint is also going up yeah. in the front. So like we're thinking about what's going on in the back, but because the scapula, you know, it's on the back, but it comes to the front, like the, the pointy bony part on the edge of your shoulder is the acromion. And so where the collarbone is inserting on that pointy edge is the acromioclavicular joint, which is all the way in the front. Mm -hmm. So it just- in the front. It's, it's all- it's all coming together. <laughs> it's true. And every, and it's, everything moves together and everything has to move together for things to work smoothly. That's right. That's right. I think it's interesting. You just made me think about how we tend to hear movement cued, like movement of the, um, of the shoulder complex around move the shoulder blades or move the arm bone. But we rarely mm -hmm. hear move the clavicle, you know, like lift your right. clavicles. It's usually just like lift your shoulder blades or something like that. But just right. to your right, appreciate it all moves together. Mm -hmm. Um, yes. And we're told, we are totally going to talk about that more, but maybe we should quickly touch on just kind of the movements available to this area Let's of the body, the general movements. And we should do mm -hmm. it pretty quickly, <laughs> I, th I think, because we could really get into, into the weeds with this, but, sure. um, yeah. So like what movements, uh, can the upper arm bone do like relative to the shoulder blade? So that would be right. like glenohumeral so, movement. Right. So the, the upper arm relative to the torso can, you can raise it in front of your body and we call that flexion. You can lower it back down or extend the arm behind you. We call that extension. Mm -hmm. Those are both in the sagittal plane. So moving front to back, you can then raise your arm out to the side into a T, uh, we call that abduct abduction. Mm -hmm. You can then take the arm from an abducted position abducted position and then take it back to your side we call that adduction a can I, deduction can i insert a question for you yeah uh you said that when we at when we abduct the arms we take them out to a t and i find that that's like uh, what oh, um anatomy books yeah. teach too but yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. i find it's snow angel might actually they go they can you can abduct them all the way up to framing yeah years. so so yeah i but that's like i was i was incomplete in well no i mean so, i think anatomy to, books that's how i see it taught in anatomy books too like that that's up but i feel like it leads sure. to some confusion 
because they, right. they can so abduct all the way you up. Can, you can take your arm out to a T, but then you can further abduct your arm mm -hmm. all the way up overhead, like if you were doing mm -hmm. a handstand. And you wind up in the same place, whether you have fully abducted your shoulder or fully flexed your shoulder, That's your right. arm is overhead. And you don't, if you didn't see how the person got there, you wouldn't necessarily know if they went into full flexion or full abduction. That's but right. But the, the, the end position is the same. Yeah, exactly. We tend to call it when the arms are just overhead, we call that shoulder flexion, but someone technically could have gotten there by sweeping the arms out and up, you know, through yes. abduction. but whatever we call it, we tend to just call it flexion once it's up. Exactly. But I just, I find that to be a confusing point that comes up sometimes when people ask yeah, questions. Well, or... it's also <laughs> confusing because um, when you talk about a deduction, yeah, bringing the arm usually back, think about yeah. bringing the arm closer to the mm. midline of the body. But once yeah. you get into elevate uh, abduction past 90 degrees, now their humerus is again coming toward more towards the center. Very yeah, um, but it's it's higher. And you so. actually, Travis, you corrected me. I don't. Are you remembering how you? Oh you yeah, got, I made a mistake about that in a in an Instagram post. It was you, a, you a had social to, media. You had to take your, your Instagram down. story down. Yeah, you were I embarrassed. Mm -hmm. It was just I, the arms. I was like, up. nobody noticed but me. <laughs> the arms were up in an overhead position, and then they were moving toward each other, and I called it a deduction. But it's not. Right. I mean, because they're moving anyway. Yeah, you could, I think, imagine why that would be an easy mistake to make. It's like I know that's a abduction, ab. But in the moment, I just was like, they're moving toward midline. It's AD, but it's not. Yeah. <laughs> so I now myself. now we know. Yeah. No, you knew that. It's yeah. I it's, knew it, it's, but it's still an easy. It's confusing. Even when you yeah. know it, it's an easy mistake. You try to follow these simple rules, and then it can lead you astray. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, the, so, the yeah. abduction and adduction are occurring in the frontal plane, mm -hmm. um, which is the plane that separates your body front to back, like jumping jacks. Actually, that's a perfect example. When you raise your arms up into the jumping jack, that's a deduction. Yeah. As the arms come down, that's a deduction. Or, or warrior, snow angel. warrior two to make it uh, yoga specific. Uh, yeah. And warrior two, the arms are they're not they're just in a T. They're not all the way up, but that's a deduction. Yeah. yeah. And if you were moving into um, uh, chair pose, we usually yeah. do that inflection. We usually do that inflection. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But if you were doing like a swan dive sort of sort of thing into forward fold that usually occurs more in the frontal plane you say yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. i would say <laughs> yeah so what other so, movements do we have then we have um internal and external rotation yeah. which are because they're rotational movements they occur in the transverse plane um that is when how do you describe this so that people who are listening <laughs> i'm i'm doing it with my arm how but about if, uh, if, like um, if you took go ahead it, how about if you're standing in like Tadasana, as we know in yoga, if you were going to externally rotate your arm, the eye, oh, of the, yeah. el the eye of the elbow would, would rotate to point forward and away from your body. And to internally mm -hmm. rotate, the eye of the elbow would spoon to point toward you and maybe back, depending on your range of motion and internal. Does that, do you think that explains it? Yeah, I like that. I was thinking like with my elbows bent at my side. Oh, you were thinking, oh yeah. Yeah. You could totally oh, okay. do it that way. Even, uh, yeah. I like the, the Tadasana. Then you can kind of see like the anatomical position. If you look in a textbook, like anatomical. Right. That Tadasana kind of is anatomical position. Yeah. For teaching uh, anatomy. If, you're, if your palms are facing forward, although then you get into like wrist. That's why I said eye of the elbow. Because then you don't <laughs> yeah. like include that's, that part. That's a great point. Yeah. So th this is movement that's occurring... All, all of these movements are rotation of the um, humerus in the glenohumeral joint, mm -hmm. um, but the internal and external rotation are pure, more pure rotation, I guess. I don't know. Oh, it's just, right. You're not, you're not moving. It's like spinning to me. It's like the upper bone is yeah, spinning that, in the... That's, that's a good way to describe it. But then the last one that uh, is universally recognized is circumduction which is movement of the arm through its largest arc of ra or range of motion. So taking the arm and if you had a paintbrush, like painting as big of a circle, uh, circle in the air as you could, whether you go forwards or backwards. So for me, uh, my, the, what comes to mind most is swimming when you swim, oh, you're circumducting yes. the shoulder. Oh, totally. Uh, I don't know if there's a good example in yoga. 
I mean, I would say just like maybe controlled shoulder circles, like full shoulder circles up and all the way back and all the way forward. Right. That's not really yeah. a traditional yoga movement, but we often, teachers often teach it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I guess that just uh, maybe speaks to this greater point that we are kind of breaking down all the shoulder movement in these um, uh, specific planes of movement, you know, forward and up, out to the side and up. But but really human movement never, like it very rarely happens specifically in just those yeah, planes. It's always it's some... Just... Yeah, it's just a, a way to conveniently describe. So if you know those mm -hmm. anatomical terms, then you can speak to other yes. uh, yoga teachers or movement professionals. And instead of saying, let's raise our arms out in front of us in the sagittal plane, you can just say flexion. But yeah, you can like be you more said, specific. It, 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 yeah, so it, it makes it easy to communicate, but it's, it's a somewhat artificial uh separation of yeah. things where sometimes things happen halfway in between those planes and there's not or, really, or a yeah. combination of movements occurring at the same time right so just to realize yeah these terms are good for language and communication and learning about the body um but yeah the body is like a 3d structure we don't like necessarily fit into just these 2d two-dimensional all the time but mm -hmm. hey travis so that was <laughs> that was just the glenohumeral joint like as we kind of talked about, sometimes we think of the shoulder as just a simple, like I get it, it's where the arm bone plugs in to the torso, but it's so much more, mm -hmm. maybe a like little more. Like an electrical more, socket. Like an electrical, plug, exactly, plugs right in. Like, pop it in. But yeah. we can see there's so much more going on. Now, maybe uh, maybe a little more briefly, we could just touch on, we do more want to talk about fire. The, the shoulder. So we just talked about arm bone and shoulder socket, but there's also the shoulder blade on the upper back and that's got its own movements. Can we yes. quickly talk about those so people know? We can raise our shoulders up in a shrug or we can lower our shoulders away from our ears. And that would be elevation when the shoulders go up, depression when the shoulders go down. Yep. We can roll our shoulders forward or allow Ooh, our mm -hmm. scapulae to wrap around towards the front of the rib cage. We call that protraction, which is the opposite of retraction when we pull our shoulder blades back. Yeah. And then we can upwardly or downwardly rotate the shoulder blades. Upward rotation is when the, um, if you're looking at someone's back and you're looking at their right shoulder blade, upward rotation would be a uh, movement of the base of the shoulder uh, counterclockwise. Shoulder blade. Base yep, of the shoulder blade. Sorry. <laughs> base of the shoulder blade moving counterclockwise. So upwardly oh, rotating. Yeah. yeah. And so then their last. Yeah. And then the last one is posterior or anterior tilt. Mm -hmm. And that is movement of the shoulder kind of as it sounds. So your shoulder blade, I keep saying shoulder. Uh, <laughs> you, if you were looking at the, uh, the top of the shoulder blade, a posterior tilt would be the top of the shoulder blade moving off of the back. Mm -hmm. uh, and an anterior tilt would be the top of the shoulder blade moving towards the rib cage. Like forward toward uh, the front of the body. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. and oftentimes these movements are, these movements can occur somewhat in isolation, but they often come paired with movement of the glenohumeral joint. So I'm really glad that you have brought this up about the fact that like the humerus and the scapula, and I guess the clavicle, I could throw that in there to be thorough, but that they all tend to move together as like this one kind of harmonious movement generally whenever we're like moving our arm around or moving our shoulders. So there's this just kind of natural coordinated cohesive movement that our nervous system automatically uh, coordinates and makes happen for us. Um, I don't know, Travis, if you find this to be the case in like the fitness strength and conditioning world, but in the yoga world, I certainly tend to, to see a lot of what I think you and I might call micromanaging. That's like a term, we, a theme term we use in, in the podcast. A lot of mm -hmm. um, yoga teaching language around micromanaging the shoulders and how they move. And often that language is um, like attempting to kind of break up the natural uh, rhythm, the natural way that the nervous system kind of coordinates all three bones to move together. Do you kind of mm -hmm. know, know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Well, and there's a good example in yoga that I've also seen in the fitness realm of just keeping the shoulder blades pinned down and back at all times, right? <laughs> yes. Regardless of what you're doing, this is like the the perfect, and it, it comes back to posture, right? It like shoulder so blades down right. and back. That's like a nice upright erect posture. And we just apply that 
haphazardly <laughs> to, all to everything. everything. Yeah. You know, oh, like raise your arms up in um, chair pose and keep your shoulder blades down and back. Like that doesn't 100%. make any sense because your shoulder blades will naturally elevate and maybe a little protraction, but at the very least elevation. Mm-hmm. Um and upwardly and so rotate, just, probably right. The uh, right, scapulas. yeah, and and yeah, and if you're trying to keep them pinned down and back, it just it doesn't Ugh, doesn't yeah. feel right to me. And and so that that one we see maybe in, in a lot of yoga poses, right? Chair pose, down dog. What yeah. else? Yeah, um, handstand. Like um, if if you play, <laughs> yeah, your another hands, one where it doesn't make any sense. Totally. Like like I've been in so many yoga classes where I'm cued, plant your hands for handstand, then pull the shoulders down the back and then go up. The one, the instance where I see it a lot in strength and conditioning is with like horizontal pulling exercises or rows, Mm -hmm. where when you row and pull your hand towards your body or pull your body towards your hand, depending on what rowing variation you're doing, you will retract and depress. But when you perform the lowering phase or the eccentric phase, you're going in the opposite direction, you should allow the shoulder blade to protract and a a lot of, so that you're getting full range of motion so that you can strengthen the shoulder blade or those muscles of the shoulder blade through Through their their full full, range of motion. And some people will just say, oh, keep your shoulder blade pinned back down and back the whole time. I've totally heard that. Absolutely. Yeah, and and um doesn't make sense. That's such a good example. And another example you just made me think of with that was um in yoga chaturanga or maybe in the fitness world push-ups. Oh yeah. But right, it's like there's this cue. I don't know if you've heard of it, Travis, but in chaturanga, uh, and then like low, say say uh, say plank pose, you start on plank, then you bend your elbows lower to chaturanga, maybe all the way to the floor. The cue is often keep your shoulder blades protracted. Like keep them broad on the back. I, I think we've talked right. about this before and you're like, that makes no sense. But there's this idea that like shoulder protraction in that position is like best and you should pin the shoulder blades there. And as you lower down, keep them protracted. But that's just going to completely like disadvantage just us. Messing, like the shoulder yeah, blades need to just move Just messing with the natural coupled motion of yes. when you push your body away from, <laughs> well, we don't do, we don't do push-ups, but in a, in a yoga context usually, but when you're pushing your body away from the floor in a push up, your shoulder blades protract, but yeah. as you lower, they you should, reach. you don't have to keep them protracted. Yeah. You allow them to retract. And that, that lets so, them move through their full range. I yeah. think a good, uh, a good way to, a good teaching tool for this that I sometimes use when I teach about this is if you just think about lifting an arm overhead, let's just say shoulder flexion. If I were to like, let's say it's like your right arm, if you were to take your left hand and put it on top of your shoulder blade and use that mm-hmm. hand to kind of pull the shoulder blade down, like you're going to pin the shoulder blade in place and then yep. lift your arm while you're pinning the shoulder blade down with your hand that, and then notice how high the arm gets. So just notice that. You can't lift it all the way up. Right. And then if you uh, take your hand off the shoulder blade, forget about pinning the shoulder blade down, then lift your arm up. You can then compare that to how high the arm goes. Clearly part of getting the arm up overhead involves that shoulder blade and clavicle, I should should say too, Mm -hmm. is allowing all of that to move together as this cohesive unit, right? Not pinning one down. Upward rotation, elevation, posterior tilt. If you don't let that happen and you're just trying to create the movement through the glenohumeral joint, like you don't have that much range of motion there. That's why the scapula is there. That's right. A hundred percent. So when, so when we try to override the natural ways the shoulder moves with things in, in yoga, movement, fitness, like with these cues that try to override that, we can just see how it might hold us back potentially mm-hmm. in uh, maybe our potential in these movements. You might not get your arms up as high. You might not have as much um, force generation available if you're not like letting the muscles move mm-hmm. through their full range, which involves moving the bones through their full range. Exactly. Um, and you've kind of alluded already to pushing and pulling uh, as we've been talking just now, but, you know, we kind of just went through in this like uh, semi-detailed manner, all these different movements available at the shoulder. And I think maybe sometimes when we learn about those, it can get us a little caught up in wanting to be overly kind of complicated in how we cue the shoulders if we're teaching movement or even if we're in Right, if body. you're looking at the joint actions. Yeah, we're like, I need to protract here and then I should upwardly, re-, like just all, like we get caught up in all of these, all mm-hmm, these little mm-hmm. options. However, 
there's maybe maybe a better or more um i don't love the word functional but it's coming to mind just meaning like um sure we, i think you know what i mean just like in how they move mm -hmm. in a practical way it's we a can, more global yes. or outside look yeah like not how so the detailed. shoulders are moving and what and yeah. that's like pulling and pushing right right travis like mm -hmm. yeah yeah so, so what's pulling and pushing about? Well, we yogis know all about pushing because yeah. that's what we do on the yoga mat. So when we're doing chaturanga, it's a chaturanga is maybe not the best example to start with because we're lowering, but we're resisting lowering, mm -hmm. which is uh, if you were thinking, if you were to think about pushing back up uh, in a push up, that's a push in a horizontal plane. You could also push in a vertical plane. So in a strength training context, we would call that an overhead press in yoga that a handstand or, or an inversion would be an example of a vertical press or push. And then you could do something kind of halfway in between, like pushing back into down dog from plank. We're kind of yeah, moving from a, a horizontal push into the, a more vertical position. So we're kind of moving through from, from one to the other, I suppose. Right. Kind but of in like, a strength yeah. training context, if you were to... Uh, ang like you take a workout bench, you angle it at 45 mm -hmm. degrees, and then you were to do presses. We call those incline presses. That's kind of at a 45 degree angle, depending on how you set, but how you set the bench, but it's at some angle in between the horizontal and vertical. Right. So that's pushing. So, pu and pushing and is just like, you're pushing a weight away from you, or you're pushing your body away from the floor. That's like why it's called pushing, right? It's like you're pushing Right. Something. So any, any time you're working with your body weight against gravity and you're, well, most of our, the orientations that we, the positions or shapes of our body in yoga, those would be examples of pushing. We're mm -hmm. always pushing our bodies away from the floor. Right. Uh, the one maybe counter would be like Purvo Tanasana where our arms are behind us. So mm -hmm. we're, we're still pushing our body away from the floor, but now we're in it's shoulder extension. Like, yeah. It's, it's a little confusing. bit of an exception, but yeah. But in general, uh, so, yeah. And then, yeah. And, and same with arm balances, mm -hmm. all pushing, all pushing. So right. then the, the converse of that is pulling, pulling would be exercises where we are, I mentioned this earlier, pulling an object toward us, which we call a row. If it's in a horizontal plane, or pulling an object straight down, like a lat pull down in the gym. Right, right. Or performing a pull up where we're hanging from the bar and pulling ourselves up and over the bar or our chins over the bar, chin up. Yeah. So you could call it that. Uh, or you could do a body weight rowing variation, like with a suspension trainer where oh, yeah. your hands are like fixed and now you're pulling your body. Yep. You're pulling your body towards the handles. And that would and be then a again, horizontal pull. Right. That's, right. That's so there's right. horizontal, there's vertical. If you pulled, if you manipulated yourself and the apparatus into, you know, you're, you were pulling from a cable that was kind of not oh, yeah. directly overhead, but not directly in front of you, but halfway in between, then that's kind of like this blended position. But the, all of this is to say that when you focus on these more macroscopic pushes and pulls, you tend to elicit most of the joint actions, right? Flexion, right. extension, abduction, adduction, um, yeah, uh, yeah, and and all of those all things of the shoulder blades. So, yeah. so it's 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 somewhat easier to say. Well, as long as we're pushing and pulling in horizontal yeah. and vertical planes, we're going to hit all of the muscles and all of the joint actions, more or less. There, there are some instances where you might want to isolate some things like shoulder external rotation for example it doesn't get hit super well in those pure push-up pull-up row um what am i missing overhead press yeah. <laughs> um, but for but for the most part if you if you do the movements then you will not neglect the muscles versus if right, you right that's so uh, true you know, if you try to get the muscles, you won't always get all of the movements. And and from a mo like a activities of daily living standpoint, we're trying to prepare ourselves to be able to move in all of the planes, pushing and pulling. So it's just a nice way to think about it and and simplify things. Um, and that I think leads into, mm -hmm. if we're ready to talk about this, the mm -hmm. idea that we in yoga we don't do any pulling. That's and right. that's like ha half of the <laughs> entire 
uh, spectrum, if you just say there's pushing and pulling for the upper body and for the shoulders, we're not doing half of those things on the yoga mat just because we can't without external the uh, training aids like weights. Right. Just with our body weight alone, apart from maybe Parvottanasana and a couple other things, which we can talk about, which are right. kind of easy and not very they're strength, not that right stimulating. Um, so I guess that that is to say that there are certain ways that we can try to work those pulling muscles, which tend to be on the posterior or backside of our our shoulders and shoulder blades. Uh, but it's going to be a lot easier to do that separately from our yoga practice if we or we're going to be able to do it better separately from our yoga practice. That's right. That's right. I think um, as a yoga teacher or practitioner, uh, as you become aware of the fact that, like you you said, a yoga practice is great, but it like kind of overlooks half of the whole ways that you could be loading your shoulders. Sometimes we think, oh, well, then I just want to bring in some more shoulder pulling into my yoga practice. So traditional yoga doesn't include any, except like we said, maybe you could say Pravotanasana, but uh, it doesn't include any, but you can go out of your way to try to do some things in mm -hmm. an actual yoga practice, but it's inherently going to be limited. I mean, it's still, I think, better than nothing. Yeah. Um, do, so do you want to rattle off some easy yeah, like, examples of things that you, you could do on the yoga mat? Yeah. Like one that pops into my mind is uh, one that, that I tend to teach a lot that I'll call like the posterior block hold where you take a, and we talked about this in our last episode on the hamstrings and muscle mm -hmm. cramping, but basically you take like a yoga block uh, or you, yeah, let's sit, let's sit yoga block behind you, press it between your hands. You're not gripping it with your fingertips and then you lift it back and up. And so mm -hmm. that would be, uh, that would be a good way to target the lats, for example, which that's a major muscle of pulling. It's like this big, broad muscle on the back. It would it would target them as you lift the block up. Yeah, in a, in a very limited range of motion. Ex in, in their super just shortened position. It's yeah. not through you a could full even range. Do that without yoga block, perhaps prone, as in oh, yes. Shalabhasana. Totally. With arms at the sides. Yeah, like lying on your belly and you lift yeah. your arms straight up. 100%. Which I, I think of more, I mean, you're in shoulder elevation, but I... To me, I feel it more in between my shoulder blades, like in that retraction. In the romb, yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. That one, yeah, for sure, for sure. But the rhomboids are another example of back, back, upper back yep. muscles that kind yeah. of get overlooked so you, in yoga. And, and you, in my favorite yoga class of yours, um, whole body back bend flow. Yeah. That's what it's called, right? Yeah, it uh, is, yeah. You do a bunch of different Shalabhasana variations. Sometimes right. the arms are right at your sides. Sometimes they're out in a T which is That's another right. good way uh -huh. to, to get you know, some in that That's same position. Yep. Uh, totally. Or Into horizontal abduction, That's which actually we, we didn't, didn't talk mention. about that. But Whoops. We, yeah. so, uh, <laughs> rewind 20 minutes and we should have mentioned that you could, there's, we talked about abduction, adduction. There's also horizontal ab and adduction. Yeah. So that would be like, if you are, lying face down and you and your arms are in a T and you raise your arms off the floor, that's horizontal abduction. Mm -hmm. And then if you were to bring your <clears throat> arms back down, then that would be horizontal a deduction. A maybe easier way to see that would be a pec fly or chest fly machine mm -hmm. or, or free weight exercise where you're lying on your back and bringing your elbows together in front of you. Yeah. Or uh, just dumbbells together. A good yoga example that I think of for horizontal adduction is eagle pose, Garudasana. Do you know eagle arms? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where the arms are intertwined yeah. in front of you. <clears throat> that's, that's a perfect example. Right, right. Yeah, so so that would be horizontal adduction. That's not necessarily a strengthening example, but it's just a positional example of horizontal adduction. Mm -hmm. So anyway, yeah, so just um, thanks for explaining. We, we overlooked those. <laughs> But the point is, yeah, there are some things that we can do that can, I, in my mind, in my a casual way of talking about it, it might like light up the back, back, upper back and back of the shoulder muscles. Like we could light them up or whatever, add a little more activation. But those types of things are good, especially when people have never really used their muscles that way, which longtime yogis, if yoga has been your main form of practice, that then you probably are like, that probably is the case for you. So these things are good. But if you compare them to something like like you just said, Travis, um, rowing like a TRX row, pulling your whole body through a full range up toward, you know, those handles and back down, 
or hanging from a bar overhead, just hanging. Yeah, even just hanging. Even yep. just hanging, yeah, not moving, but just hanging. But then of course- That's all hard the, for people who've hard, never done it. Who've never done it. And if you think about it, that's like um, hanging from a bar is like a perfect compliment to something like a handstand or a down mm -hmm. dog where in handstand and down dog, the arms are overhead and you're pushing the floor away. It's a vertical push. If all we do is yoga for our movement practice, we never get that, you know, complimentary pull, but hanging from a bar would be a great way to kind of round that out. can, as you would say, make our shoulders very happy. <laughs> hanging <laughs> totally. Yeah, totally. And then of course, layering on um, progressions toward pull-ups and things yeah. like that. And it's, Excellent. it's funny because as children, like we do monkey bars. Yeah. Um, it's, and, but as adults, we don't do monkey bars. We should, um, but oftentimes <laughs> right. if you go to try monkey bars as an adult, yes. it, you just can't, uh, it's hard to hang, let alone take one hand off and go to the next bar. So, but that's like, uh, it's a very relevant, well, maybe not very relevant. It is a movement um, <laughs> that's worthwhile from a, a 360 degrees mm -hmm. comprehensive shoulder strengthening Absolutely. aspect. Absolutely. And, and that's why- maybe, maybe you won't ever have to do it in, you're not gonna be like- Hanging from trees in, in or the, a bar. In the zombie apocalypse where you're like <laughs> having to get across this monkey bar thing, otherwise you're gonna get eaten by the, I don't know. Right, 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 right. Like it's, um, I think I, I think I see what you're saying. Maybe just more that in daily life, you know, we might press our, like reach up overhead to get a glass or something, which that's technically would be, I guess, more of a push. Right. But when mm -hmm. in daily life, are we like pulling unless we're hanging from something, which we don't tend to do. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Think, yeah. But it's, it's still worthwhile because yeah. it, it is counterbalancing 100%. all of the pushing that you're doing on the yoga mat and counterbalancing is an effective way to keep your shoulders healthy. A hundred percent, Travis, because not to, to, um, be fear mongery at all, because that's right. like the last thing I ever want to be, or one of the last things I ever want to be. But I think we all know, and it may be even ourselves if we're listening to this, but I think we know that it's quite anecdotally common in a yoga context for longtime yogis who do lots and lots of vinyasas to sometimes develop something that's sometimes called like casually called like chaturanga shoulder or just this kind of, um, you know, uh, pain at the front of the shoulder or just pain in general that they feel that they associate in their mind with say something like chaturanga or their yoga practice. Yeah. If chaturanga hurts, then that's an easy connection to make. Yeah, exactly. So not, not trying to imply that chaturanga is hurting you, but sometimes right. people, you know, there's this, um, there's always a bigger picture to movement. And if you're doing a whole bunch of chaturangas, uh, and then you're not loading your shoulders in other ways that just target the shoulder in other ways and develop different types of strength, perhaps, perhaps there could be something to the repetitive nature of doing a bunch of chaturangas and not like maybe missing this whole other 50% of ways you could move your shoulder. So I've, I've just found like anecdotally in people that I know that sometimes if they f start associating some shoulder pain with like their long-term yoga practice, if they start incorporating pulling strengthening exercises into their movement routine, that often they find that that shoulder discomfort kind of goes away and they don't have to stop doing yoga, but maybe they just bring in something that they weren't doing. And that variability right. in and of it's itself. The yeah. The novelty. The maybe novelty. it's not that. Yeah. It's hard to say, oh, well, because mm -hmm. you haven't been doing this, but you've been doing that, or because you're very strong and on this yeah. side of the joint and weak, that's going to guarantee that you have a problem. But just the idea of introducing something new can be helpful. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and like we mentioned, yoga is very loads the shoulders in one way and it's fine. There's, it's great. I mean, yoga is great at doing that, like, but it doesn't mean yoga is missing anything. You know, it's not to try to make say that yoga is bad or something. It's just mm -hmm. all movement practices only load your body in the way that that specific movement practice does. So it's well, not, yeah. so you know, another good example, the counter example would be rock climbing and swimming where oh, yeah. all you're doing is pulling yourself up on the rock wall. All you're doing is pulling yourself forward when you're swimming. Even backstroke is really still the same thing, even though you're circumducting your arms in the opposite direction, all the, if you look closely at the biomechanics of all the strokes there, the arm motion is actually not that different. Uh, but anyway, those would be examples where they're not bad either. You just yeah. need to be doing other things 
in conjunction yes. to keep your shoulders happy. Yeah. Maybe. That, that, again, it's not to say that you're going to guarantee yeah. pain uh, and injury if you're not cross training. That's right. But it can be helpful. Yeah, something to consider if maybe you are experiencing some some pain. Certainly, if you're considering pain or if if you're experiencing some pain, that's like option number one. Is well, let's try to do something different. Yeah. Well, what are we missing? Oh, in yoga, we're missing this pulling, and in rock climbing and swimming, we're missing the pushing. So right. actually, <laughs> you can do all of the things in strength training, but if you were a yogi who liked mm -hmm. to swim or rock climb, mm -hmm. that would be a really harmonious combination or vice versa. 100%. Yeah, it's not like strength training is the only option or the only one way for people. There are lot, lots of different activities. Um, but speaking of strength training, Travis, uh, this would you say that this is why in our Five Weeks to Strong and Flexible Shoulders program, that's why we've really intentionally brought in shoulder pulling, like strength, shoulder pulling strength work. Yeah. I. I I would say that or we probably have why. about a 50-50 a split. Yes, it's not only pulling at the, all. The pushing and the pulling. Yeah, because... Because why? The, this is a, another conversation yes. which maybe we can get into. But I think we should. just the idea that that the pushing movements that we do in yoga aren't very progressive. Exactly. So Thank you, you for could, saying that. You could have... You could be a very dedicated yogi for many years and still not be able to do a good push-up, for example. I think we know lots um, of examples. That or, was me. <laughs> yeah. Or, or still struggle with handstand or mm -hmm. arm balances. And and the the tricky part is just that it's the poses are kind of the poses. And, you know, some yeah. good yoga teachers can find ways to modify and work up to those more challenging poses. But oftentimes, I think you just kind of get thrown in and you're trying to do the thing, but you're not really doing it that well and you never get better at it, which I think you could probably speak to from your experience. Mm -hmm. And it's just a strength training practice lends itself better to, in my opinion, a more gradual or graded or progressive approach where you're able to keep track of the weights that you're using and the variations that you're doing. Yes. We, Cause we, especially the way that we do it, we recommend writing everything down mm -hmm. so that then you can refer back to it the next time you're approaching that workout or those movements and just make sure that you're making progress in some way, shape or form, whether it's adding weight or doing more reps or doing a more challenging variation or holding some position for longer all of those things would be ways to progressively overload and get stronger. And that's just not what yoga is about. If you want to build strength towards some of these super strong uh, movements, like in a strength training context, what you would do is you would, you would expose your body to a certain, uh, to the a, a right amount of load that meets you like just at your strength edge and maybe a little bit beyond that. It's like pushing you just a little bit so that mm -hmm. you can um, adapt or grow stronger and then you increase it just a little bit. And so it's, you know, very graded, but in a yoga context, there are so many instances where these poses are just so hard that they're, mm -hmm. they're like way above the ceiling of many people's like, capa like uh, capacity, you know, they're way beyond that. So they've kind of skipped that whole, that whole spectrum where ideally they would have met someone just a little bit beyond their capacity. And then as they grew stronger, they'd increase just a little bit. And so if you're just doing that, and that's what I did uh, for years and years in my, uh, for example, in my Ashtanga practice, which that's like kind of known to be one of the, the strongest forms of yoga, yada, yada, yada. It's got all these super challenging poses, but I, I found that after eight years of a consistent, dedicated Ashtanga practice, um, one of the things I liked about it was that I always felt super challenged in my practice. You know, like afterwards I'd feel really wiped out and like, gosh, I just did so much good work. I got really strong. But now I, I, I eventually kind of woke up to realizing like, I, I guess if I think about it, like always feeling challenged from this practice in the same way for eight years may indicate to me that maybe I wasn't actually getting stronger because if I really was, then that practice, Ashtanga is a very repetitive practice, you know? And yoga in general, as much as yoga classes may change from class to class, they're also as a whole pretty repetitive in general. Um, they should, it sh Ashtanga should have gotten easier for me over time as my body adapted. Mm -hmm. But instead, those hard poses just stayed hard the whole time. 
Um, and like you said, like I still couldn't actually really do a really good chaturanga, like a well-controlled chaturanga or a push-up if we're going to use the gym term. I wasn't strong mm -hmm. enough to like do a full range single push-up in, you know, a really well-controlled manner. I was always like kind of wriggling my way around and kind of avoiding the work because it was so, it was too hard for me. So that's the yeah. whole point It's just the other side of the coin is if you're exposing people to movements that are much higher than their current level, they're also not going to adapt and get stronger because it's just too strong for right. them. Right. Mm -hmm. And so kind of totally. realizing, yeah. So just that's a, a, that's another reason why, uh, why yoga may not be the best vehicle for truly building, um, building strength over time, both just progressive strength and strength in that well-rounded manner, as far as, you know, if we're thinking of the shoulders, like we're never pulling. Right. So we're kind of so, missing. So it's, it's not optimally designed for strength period. And then <laughs> even the movements yeah. that it does expose you to, which is these pushing movements in, in all the planes, uh, but even with those, if you've been doing yoga for eight years and you, your still chaturanga still isn't great, like what's the deal? Exactly. Exactly. And so sometimes I think it just takes a little stepping back and maybe looking at one's yoga path, like, and, and look back over, over time, like, where have I really come as far as strength? I mean, yoga has so many other things to offer, you know, you and I just, we're kind of pulling out the strength variable in our work together. Um, and it's not to yeah. overlook the many other ways that a yoga practice can be beneficial. Totally. Uh, we just think strength is, we think it's super beneficial um, in so many ways and um, including just like health benefits, confidence in right. your body. Right. From all of those perspectives and taking it back to the yoga mat. Mm, building oh, strength exactly. And, you know, in a, in a different context and then coming back to the yoga mat and be like, wow, these chaturangas are so much easier. I can, uh, float between these positions or I can hold this challenging position position that used to be challenging for me much more easily and so on. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah, building strength off the mat will help make our yoga practice more easeful, which arguably a more, you know, be feeling more easeful and less just like overwhelmed in the super tough poses that may lend itself to um, helping support the other so that the other benefits of yoga maybe could um, have an effect more efficiently. Yeah. If, if the, if certain aspects of, let's say it's a Ashtanga practice where it's kind of a consistent pattern or, or progression mm -hmm. of exercises or poses, if there are certain parts of it that aren't supposed to be hard, but are hard for you, <laughs> yeah. um, then you're not necessarily getting like the intended benefit out of it, or it, mm -hmm. I, you're getting a different benefit out of it than what somebody else is getting out of it which is maybe fine and maybe like for a long time you liked that, but mm -hmm. then I think you turned on to the idea of like, oh, it's not supposed to be that hard That's or it's not right. supposed to stay that hard for so long. What's going on here? Yeah. And I had other stuff going on too that we've talked about on the podcast before, just like nagging aches and pains, you know, which now I think maybe associated more just with like repetitively doing the same thing and not doing other things, you know? Mm -hmm, so that also mm -hmm. kind of caused me to make some changes in my movement practice, but yeah, there's, it's always like a big, a big picture. Um, but, you know, um, while we're kind of on this topic of shoulder strength and a yoga practice, a question that we tend to get a lot, and we actually got some listener questions about this as well for this episode, is just um, in general, uh, when it comes to like shoulder pain and potentially injury, which I know pain and injury are really distinct concepts. I'm kind of lumping them. Lumping them is a similar related concept together. But when it comes mm -hmm. to shoulder pain and injury in a yoga context, um, what can be done to like kind of optimize so that we protect our shoulders from pain and or injury? <laughs> well, the, the first line of thinking most yoga teachers would go to would be fix, fixing alignment, right? Right. Like aligning your shoulders in the correct way to protect them, right? In yoga. Yeah. Quote unquote, correct. Quote unquote, protect. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, if that's the, if that's what like the um, prevailing idea is around protecting the shoulders, if, if it's alignment, um, what would you say to that, Travis? I think that that can be one part of it. But I also think that oftentimes we look at someone performing a pose and maybe they're having pain or they're not having pain. And we say, oh, that's wrong. 
you know, you need to do it this way or that way. And uh, it just, you don't know that right. for sure. Right. I mean, there, sure, certainly there are instances where it's like they're trying to do a down dog and that doesn't look anything like a down dog. <laughs> and like, then we need to like take a step back. But it, but there are certain, especially when we, like we talked about before, those like micromanage EQs, mm -hmm. there are certain things that we assume are going to be correct for everybody. And we, whether somebody's in pain or not, uh, we try to make everybody fit a particular mold, a particular alignment yeah. when there's just a lot of variation between yeah. people anatomically, strength wise, um, movement, history wise, injury history wise, where you just can't know for sure that like externally rotating the shoulders in this particular pose is the right way to do it. And we'll internally rotating you. them is the, yeah, is the wrong way to do it you're bound to get injured if you yeah. do it the wrong way, or this is the sole explanation for why you're experiencing pain, which like if I, you know, our, our regular listeners will know that pain and injury are multifactorial and yeah. likely are not due to just one internal or external rotation of the shoulder, <laughs> uh, in one yoga pose. So one, it's just, yeah. yeah, it's just, you can't know what's going to be right for everybody from a, an alignment standpoint. And there could be many reasons why someone is experiencing pain. Alignment could be one of them. Changing something or adjusting something could help. It doesn't necessarily mean that uh, it has to change forever. It could just be a temporary modification to allow somebody to embody a shape or pose right. for the short term while they're while the pain kind dies, of sensitive flared up or down, sensitive. Yeah. yeah. And then they could go, maybe go back, uh, but it's also like there's the, the amount of load, the, the progression of load over time is a huge factor. Is that um, because so Travis, just... is that because strength may have a connection with, um, with resilience and potentially reducing risk of injuries, like your one's level of strength? Maybe. So if you, there, there are certainly instances of this that you know, from a research standpoint, we know for sure mm -hmm. that strength is protective against certain types of injuries. Um, we also can say that strengthening can be, or strength training or resistance training can be an effective treatment when you are in pain. Right. Uh, the mechanism behind that isn't necessarily just that you're getting stronger, mm -hmm. but strength has many benefits from a preventive or risk reduction standpoint, as well as from a treatment paradigm. Yeah. That may, that makes a lot of sense to me just, um, intuitively, like if, if strength training and doing so in a way that actually builds strength, uh, you know, like actually results in getting stronger, if that makes our muscles and tendons and our tissues in general stronger it just seems on like this one level that like they're yeah therefore... from a very simple level if if injury results when the um load or frequency of the load exceeds mm -hmm. the capacity yeah. of the tissues then if you can increase that capacity which we call the envelope of function if we can expand that to tolerate more load or more frequent load then injury will be less likely to ensue at a given load and frequency. Precisely. Yeah. So if we increase their capacity, then they should be able to um, you know, bear more load or withstand more load. Just like, like you said, on that simple level, that simple equation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so anyway, yeah, that's another reason why we love five weeks of strong and flexible shoulders because just increasing strength. And as we talked about in our last um, podcast episode on the hamstrings, this idea that building stronger hamstrings may be protective against something like the super common yoga bud or high hamstring tendinopathy. Right? It's not like a guarantee that if you don't do these things, you're bound to get hurt and have pain and be dysfunctional, mm -hmm. whatever that means. Um, but it's just like, hey, if you want to do all the things to put yourself in the best position for a positive outcome and to continue to um, do your yoga practice pain free in the long term, like this is a good idea to add it in. So Travis, we actually, in preparation for this episode, we threw out to our listeners uh, if they wanted to submit any questions about the shoulders. And we had a couple that we wanted to address here in this episode. 
And the first question that I thought was a really good one was why do shoulders like click and pop so much? Like, why do they make so much noise? And mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, have you experienced that like in your body? Oh yeah, <laughs> plenty. Not just the shoulders, but including the shoulders. Right, right, right. Totally. The, these like joint pops and noises are not like only in the shoulders, like people's knees pop and their hips pop and the spine pops. Like if, you know, especially when you think of things like chiropractic adjustments and all those pops you hear. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's, it's kind of like a bigger topic. Uh, there's, I've experienced at least that there tend to be a lot of kind of like fear mongering messages around when you hear these joint noises, uh, specifically like with the hip, I've heard a lot of, you know, like if you feel um pop, like snapping hip is kind of one of the one of the terms that you hear like and it's this pop that sometimes you feel a sensation with and that that's really bad and that means that you have like poor hip mechanics is going to lead you know to future injury and blah 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 but anyway we would just like to uh point out that uh joints actually it's really natural for them to make noise like it just uh it's just like the body makes noise and research has actually looked at these joint noises, which have a technical medical term. They're called crepitus. You've heard that term before, right? Right, mm -hmm, Travis? Mm -hmm. Crepitus. Sounds more <laughs> shocking than it maybe is. Yeah, it's too, it, it almost sounds, sounds like a more negative. Serious. Yeah, like creep and crep. I don't know. Like it just sounds, yeah. So, sounds like a negative medical condition or something. But it's actually mm -hmm. completely benign and completely normal, these joint noises. Uh, the uh, My understanding is that the actual mechanism behind the noise, like what's making the noise, isn't even really 100% understood. But one working theory is it's like um, like air bubbles in the, in the joint cavity kind of popping as you move. Like that's one explanation. Oh, cracking of knuckles is another common example of crepitus, like in your knuckles. Mm -hmm. So what research has really strongly suggested about joint noises is that um, as long as you don't, they're not accompanied by pain or swelling or an acute injury, as long as they're not accompanied by those things, then these joint noises are benign and there's nothing to worry about. So if you just find that your shoulders, as you move them through a range, like pop and crack, crack and make noise, that's actually just like really normal. Uh, if it's associated with pain, if you feel pain as that's happening, then of course, you know, it'd be recommended to have it checked out by a medical professional. But in general, maybe we can just like kind of suggest that joint noises are just normal. In fact, there is one, cool study that was looking at joint noises and knees and it actually found this correlation between people who had noisy knees or had knees that made noise actually had healthier knees than people who didn't like on imaging which i thought was kind wow. of crazy i don't know i haven't come across that right 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 i can send it to you later um but yeah so i think just you know uh it's easy to just hear something in the body you know and not we don't know where it emanates from and it can be easy to get caught up in a worry about it. Yeah. And I guess yeah. if, if the question is like, why do the shoulders make so much noise? You know, like I, I agree. I feel like maybe they make more noise than some other areas of the body. I don't really know, but one suggestion might be that um, as we've talked about in our conversation, the shoulder is a complex region and it's got multiple joints going on, right? Like there are four joints there. So maybe they're just mm -hmm. multiple joints and therefore there's more propensity for popping to happen where there are more yeah. joints. I don't know. Maybe they're closer to your ear. So you can <laughs> hear it better. <laughs> I don't know about that though. Like if my, my ankle tends to crack a lot, I can still hear oh, that. Oh, pretty far. So. <laughs> your ankle is probably almost as far away as you can get from your ear. Right. I think so. In your body. <laughs> I was at the prosthetist, uh, a oh. few weeks ago and, uh, my, I was having issues with my prosthetic knee and he was like, what's that noise? And it was just my ankle cracking. Oh my <laughs> gosh. He was, like, he was like, what is that? Uh, and I, I don't know. I don't usually notice it, but it, it kept cracking. That's so And it was, yeah. it was just confusing because we were trying to troubleshoot my broken prosthetic knee and here I was getting this other noise. <laughs> and it was loud enough that he could hear it. Oh it yeah. Like, yeah. So, yeah. So, totally. Right. And it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with your ankle. It just, it just makes noise. Cause that just yeah, happens. my ankle is perfectly healthy. Right, right. And shoulders that are noisy, you know, that doesn't mean that there's that there's anything. You know, yeah, the, the one thing, one thing that like if if you have to do something funky to make a noise, you're like, oh, check out like when I do this weird thing with my shoulder, it makes this noise. 
like maybe don't do oh, that weird thing that makes that right. noise but if it's just making a noise during regular movements like that's fine right totally or did you know that there's actually there's been some research done on knuckle cracking and you know how there's this common caution against knuckle cracking like don't crack your knuckles it'll give you arthritis like that's like a common yeah. But do you know the research has actually looked at it and there's just like no difference between people who crack their knuckles and don't as far as like correlation with things like osteoarthritis in the um, finger joints. So keep on cracking. Yeah, exactly. I think this re this study that I that I had uh, that I looked at, like they said something like it, it appears that that the worst uh, consequence of cracking knuckles is just the annoyance of the observer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like like hearing you crack your knuckles and getting annoyed. That's like the worst. Yeah. I, I have heard though, like like I like to crack my neck. Mm -hmm. And it, that could be a a symptom that I actually just need to stretch my neck. Mm. Like I, maybe mm -hmm. <laughs> like if you feel like you, you know, you need to crack a joint or you need to go to the chiropractor frequently, maybe there's a different intervention that would help give you the mobility or flexibility or comfort in the joint that you would then not feel the need to crack. But mm -hmm. I don't know. That's just one person's opinion, I think. Right. <laughs> but it could be. So I have another listener question to, to toss out at you. Um, and maybe we can just kind of address address these next couple quickly. But uh, the, quest, the question was, the heads of my shoulders round forward. What are effective ways to overcome this? And another super similar question is, worked on my shoulders for years and they're still internally rotated. What's a good daily protocol? Um, yeah. So what do you think about, what do you think about those questions about the shoulders? Uh, well, I think that we talked, maybe talked about this in the posture episode. With Todd Hargrove. Yeah. Whatever we, that was episode 25. Mm, I, think I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever, whatever we talked about posturally related, like this is a posture question. It totally is. And yeah. I think the, the, if people are looking at this and thinking about shoulder strengthening, they, it might be, and I thought this originally, it might, you might look at it and say, well, my shoulders are rounded forward. I just need to strengthen my upper back. Mm -hmm. I need to do rows and I need to do face pulls and that'll get me into a, a get me out of that rounded shoulder posture. And the, other simple way of looking at it to explain why that isn't true is just doing three sets of 10 repetitions of face pulls or rows or whatever isn't going to be, it's a drop in the ocean compared to how you're holding yourself the other 167 hours and 57 minutes of the day, right? So just, you of, yeah, you of can the bring, week. You said yeah, hours. of the week, <laughs> yeah. of the week. Mm -hmm. So you can bring awareness. So I, I don't, I try not to call those things postural exercises like other people do. Mm -hmm. I might refer to them as postural awareness exercises. Mm -hmm. So yeah, like the muscles on the backs of your shoulders, the posterior delts, um, whatever else are, Rhombus. are, yeah, are muscles that contribute to posture, at, but just getting them stronger or increasing their size isn't necessarily going to change the way that you hold yourself. That's right. It's not um, the same variable. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like you don't, your shoulders aren't necessarily rounded because your shoulders are too weak to hold yourself upright or, or maybe there, maybe there are lacking some sort of endurance, but just doing the three sets of 10 face pulls aren't going to create the endurance that you need in those muscles to uh, have a more erect posture 24 hours out of the day. So but, I think it's more good. Uh, I was going to ask if we took a step back and looked at the question of rounded shoulders to begin with, is that something that's inherently problematic? Like, does that inherently need fixing? Only if it, it's a personal preference. Right. If, if someone you doesn't like see, how it looks. Right. If you don't like how it looks, then yeah, so that 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 underpins all of this of that that's not necessarily something that you need to even address. If you choose to address it, then what's the best way to address it? Well, strengthening can bring awareness to those muscles, but it's not going to necessarily change yeah, your ability to hold yourself like that 
that is more of just a conscious decision mm -hmm. to hold yourself in a different posture, which isn't easy to do. Uh, it's very hard to do. Right. Because it's kind of changing the way your nervous system habitually positions you. I think it's certainly valid to like, if you just don't like the way it looks and you would like to change it, then, you know, to, uh, embarking on an attempt to change it is, is fine. But if you believe that you need to change it because you think that having the rounded shoulders forward around, uh, yeah, rounded forward shoulders will create pain or somehow is just bad for you, like on a health level or something. I think that's where we could just suggest like, you don't actually need to worry about it for those reasons. Right. right? Yeah. If you're already in pain, then it's a little bit of a different story. And, and we that's what Todd explained. Yeah, that's right. right? So we it's can refer back. Yeah. Posture is overrated, but it doesn't mean it's not relevant yeah. in some instances. 100%. Uh, maybe one more quick uh, listener question that I thought was a good one, because I've certainly heard this caution in the yoga world quite a bit myself. Uh, the question was side plank to wild thing. So this transition, mm. side plank into wild thing doesn't seem great for the shoulder yet it's often cued that's what this person submitted yep and um and i've heard this a lot like a, i've seen a lot of fear mongering around that transition like side plank and you step in a wild thing that's going to i've heard any number of things tear your rotator cuff like create shoulder instability like all this stuff mm -hmm. what do you think about that it reminds me of warrior three to half moon that is such a good example. Which I don't know. I don't know if we've debunked that on the podcast. We have not. I have a YouTube video okay. about it. Yeah. But you're. I, I mean, at least in my memory, I don't think we've talked about that in the podcast. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's, little, it's sort of the opposite, just anatomically, because you're you're. Um, it's not exactly the same in the shoulder, but it's it's a closed mm -hmm, chain mm -hmm. transition in from one hip position and. Or shoulder yeah. position into a different position. closed chain meaning that the end of the limb is fixed right the foot mm -hmm, or the hand is mm -hmm, fixed on the floor mm -hmm. and then you're moving the shoulder relative to that is that what you mean yeah yeah so the the open chain counterpart to that if you were going so if you're going from side plank to wild thing you're moving into shoulder abduction that yeah horizontal abduction yeah pretty much right yeah, yeah pretty sorry much. horizontal abduction so, yeah. so that's a movement that you could train like with free weights or with cables. Right, right. In, a, in an open chain fashion. Uh, so your, your arm would be moving, your body would be still. There's no difference. Your shoulder doesn't know <laughs> the difference in the load, whether you're in an open chain or a closed chain. So in, in, the I, fitness, I just... in the fitness world, do they caution against building strength that way? Like in moving from... There's just not, there's not really a, a fitness counterpart to that transition That's that I can think point. of. It's, yeah. Yeah. You're, you're just saying you, one could, if they wanted to build strength, they could um, devise like a strength move that would do that. But it's not yeah, like a classic. Well, in, in an open chain, any sort of uh, horizontal abduction exercise, rear delt fly is working that those muscles maybe not exactly oh, in the that's same a good point. plane. That's a really good point. But like, that's a, that's a joint action that we do strengthen and is worth strengthening. So I yeah, just don't totally. see any, any problem with it. Just like with the half moon to warrior, warrior three. three, it's warrior back. three to half yeah. moon and then back. Yeah. 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 The, Shredding the, the hip acetabulum hip or something. The yeah. Hip the hip labrum. Labrum. That's the cop. Yeah. yeah. That total, that transition is very fear mongered about in the yoga world. And I t completely agree with you. Thanks for making that connection to the side plank to wild thing being similar to that. It's a, it, yeah, your, your body weight is on that arm, right? Right. Right. Uh, so you're moving. So, so if, that. if that's a lot for you, then okay. Uh, maybe, maybe you want to build up strength with five weeks of strong and flexible shoulders. Yes. Uh, if, if that totally. transition feels challenging for you, or if it feels like a lot of load, um, but I don't see it as inherently problematic. It's like right. anything. It's like anything, right? Like it's about your, your current capacity and like what loads are involved in the movement and if, if it's within your capacity or not. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So someone like completely who'd been sedentary their whole life and they're completely brand new to yoga. I mean, maybe even just side plank period might be too much for them. Like maybe they would yeah. need to do side plank with the knee down, you know, like a regress variation. So for sure, right. if you throw someone into 
a movement or transition that's beyond their current capacity, that could be a little more injurious, but um, that's very contextual. But like you just perfectly said, just you don't see it as injurious inherently, like for everybody. Right. If side plank is in your movement vocabulary and wild thing are in your movement vocabulary, then there's no reason why you can't go in between them in that way. (laughs) There you go. Uh, Well, like what's the difference moving from down dog to wild thing? I I mean, I see it's a little different, but aren't you kind of going through a side plank to get there? You 100% are. Thank you for pointing that out. I mean, they're slightly different, you know, in down dog, you're pushed back a little for, you know, your hips are back a little more, but it ultimately yeah. they're, they're within the same broad movement pattern down dog. But people don't f- worry about that. The dog. Yeah. I've actually, I've heard some, I've heard more fear mongering from they do. Side, like the wild thing, but yeah, I have heard from like the flip. Yeah. I actually okay. wild thing in general, like a, a few years ago, there was a huge kind of big thing in the yoga community where someone wrote this like kind of prominent article that featured like a picture of a of a shoulder with i forget just like a bunch of um claw marks on it like a shredded shoulder and they were tying it to it was i think it was wild thing not the transition into wild thing but just wild thing itself is an inherently injurious pose and yoga like no one should do it in yoga we shouldn't be teaching it and it was passed around a bunch in the yoga world i wasn't a big fan of that article you can imagine yeah yeah so maybe maybe a question like this that that this listener asked, which I like I said, I'm very I'm really familiar with those cautions. I've seen them quite a bit. I wonder if it may be partly influenced by that big um, you know article that made its way through. Who knows? But yeah, it's just interesting the the ideas that we get around certain movements. Mm-hmm. But anyway, Travis, uh, I don't know about you, but I feel like we pretty thoroughly have kind of talked about. Uh, talked through the shoulders and how they move, their anatomy, how we might think about them in terms of yoga, in terms of strength training, uh, and some other good like uh, questions and and myths around them. Do you feel like we kind of covered all that? I think so. (laughs) So maybe we can wrap up this conversation then and uh, thank our listeners for tuning in. Hopefully you learned some new tidbits around this area of the body and maybe you can, you know, maybe you're influenced to think about it or treat it a little bit differently moving forward in your yoga movement practice in general. So thanks so much for being here with me today, Travis. Thank you, Jenny.